St. Luke's Medical Center, we foster a culture of care. We live by the mission to provide compassionate, patient-centered At St. Luke's Medical Center, we foster a culture of care. We live by the mission to provide compassionate, patient-centered experience guided by excellence and innovation. We have the vision to be the unparalleled leader in patient care, clinical outcomes, research and education. And as we uphold and nurture a culture of care, we work with integrity, healthcare excellence, accountability, responsibility, and teamwork. Because at St. Luke's, care is our core. It is our culture. We care for our people as much as we care for our patients. St. Luke's Medical Center. We love life.
What the world needs now is people. People who see things just a little bit differently. Who go out of their way to find a new perspective and a new way forward. People who make faraway places feel closer with flight that's more fuel efficient. Who put the focus of healthcare where it belongs on making patients healthier. People who see how more sustainable energy can power daily life while powering progress. Because seeing a smarter, healthier, cleaner world isn't something that's far in the future. It's something we're building now. GE, building a world that works. Beyond Imaging Healthcare is experiencing a dynamic transformation. Advanced technologies are revolutionizing clinical, operational and financial outcomes to solve cost, quality and access challenges. Change is made possible by growth of IoT, greater computing power, secure networks, democratized cloud storage, real-time data analytics, Adaptive UX technologies will actively sense, learn, and transform environments. Integrated imaging devices will be aware, intuitive, and predictive. Artificial intelligence will provide an elevated experience across the imaging value chain. The result? A new era in personalized, patient-centered care, delivering improved outcomes. This is the future of imaging we are working to create. Asia, where opportunities abound and the fastest economic growth achieved is also witnessing the fastest growth in the healthcare sector. Which is why we've established our presence and positioned ourselves as the partner of choice to bring important healthcare brands across the region. Menorini Asia Pacific. As part of a leading global biopharmaceutical company, Menorini Asia Pacific's capabilities span the entire pharmaceutical development life cycle. A fully integrated biopharmaceutical company capable of research, development, manufacturing, regulatory affairs and commercialization. Beyond end-to-end -end capabilities and cross-functional expertise, Menorini Asia Pacific has also become the preferred partner for leading healthcare companies around the world. Expertise in building healthcare brands, flexible business model, and dedicated alliance management to create value for our partners have enabled us to make strategic acquisitions and licensing arrangements, consequently, taking many brands to greater heights. 
Our rapidly growing businesses are bolstered by over 3,300 sales, marketing and support professionals operating in 13 key markets. Our sales and marketing strategies, underpinned by local patient and physician insights, have helped many companies with varying needs tap into the Asia-Pacific growth story. Whether for new brands or line extensions, pharmaceutical or biotechnology companies can gain rapid market access to the region and manage their risks by leveraging on our strengths as a gateway to Asia Pacific, a reliable partner whose network and reach extends beyond the region with a strong track record offering unparalleled customer experience. Founded in 1886, the name Menorini has through the generations become synonymous with the mark of quality. A trusted biopharmaceutical company with a strong tradition in partnering, an established presence in over 100 countries with more than 16,000 employees, Menorini is bringing its illustrious heritage and compelling values into the next century. And here in Asia Pacific, our ongoing commitment is to deliver quality healthcare brands, invigorating lives across the region. Your partner, your brand, at your service. Manarini, Asia Pacific. We present to you this year's celebration of the International Day of Radiology 2022 with the theme Radiology Practice Guidelines and Algorithms brought to you by St. Luke's Medical Center, Institute of Radiology. In line with the norms due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we are all gathered in this three-hour conference in a digital platform. But with or without pandemic, it is great that we all come together with a common goal to celebrate this day to spread awareness of the many benefits of medical imaging and also take this day to thank the many radiographers and radiologists who are working hard to improve our lives. To start off with today's event, we will all have a moment to reflect with a prayer followed by the Philippine National Anthem. Let us remember that we are in the most holy presence of our Lord. 
that through my eyes, I see the reason for my patient's suffering, that I may understand and correlate the pertinent clinical history, that I may have the knowledge to provide a reasonable differential diagnosis, that I treat patients with care, compassion, and without prejudice, that I work well with technologists, nurses, staff, and other physicians, that you help my family and friends understand the nature of my work, that you keep my family safe while I work, that you keep me safe, especially on my way home, that you give me mental and physical strength to sustain my work, that I continue my vacation and achieve my personal endeavors to glorify you. These I ask of you, O Lord. Amen. Let us all prepare for the Philippine National Anthem. Radiology Residency Training Officer of St. Luke's Medical Center, Quezon City. I would like to welcome each and every participant here today from all over the country and abroad. We are all excited to this year's program with a lineup of speakers from our institute who are experts in the lecture topics that they will be sharing to us momentarily. With today's theme and with the vast knowledge and experience of our speakers, I hope that we could be updated with the current practice guidelines for us to have a more standardized practice of radiology in each of our centers and workplace. I'd like to introduce to you my counterpart from St. Luke's Global City, who will be co-moderating with me today, Dr. Mary Rose Lazo. Good evening to you as well, my lovely co-moderator, Dr. Katlea Manlapas. Distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends, it is our pleasure to celebrate with you the International Day of Radiology for the year 2022. We will hear from five radiology subspecializations, pediatric radiology, neuroradiology, abdominal radiology, breast imaging, and thoracic radiology, covering the current radiology practice guidelines and algorithms. I am certain that these selected topics will provide us all with a wealth of information and many opportunities for discussions. Let me not delay you any further, and I am honored to introduce our department head, St. Luke's Medical Center Institute of Radiology, Dr. Nelson V. Pasha. Good day, everyone. Welcome to all our colleagues from the Philippines and from all over the world to our postgraduate course in celebration of International Day of Radiology 2022. Today, we are glad to present to everyone the Radiology Practice Guidelines and Algorithm. We will discuss different guidelines for different cancers such as liver, lung and breast cancer, as well as strokes and pediatric pneumonia. Lectures will be provided by our experts from various radiology subspecialties. I would like to thank our moderators, Dr. Mary Rose Lazo and Dr. Katlea Manlapas, as well as our program director, Dr. Bernard F. Laya. We would also like to thank our industry partners for their generous educational grant. Again, I would like to thank everyone and I hope you enjoy the program. Thank you Dr. Pasha for spearheading this valuable academic activity. 
And now may I introduce our Academics and Research Officer of the Institute of Radiology, St. Luke's Medical Center, and the Program Director of this event, Dr. Bernard F. Lyon. Welcome to another edition of International Day of Radiology, brought to you by St. Luke's Medical Center Institute of Radiology. To celebrate this momentous event, we have once again crafted a course that is of high value and extremely relevant. Radiology plays a crucial role in confirming the diagnosis, determining the extent of disease, and assessment of complications. But to optimize its use, it is very important to select the appropriate imaging tool for a particular clinical situation. And to do this, it is important to consider many factors, including the severity of disease, the patient's age, availability of machines, and of course, the expertise of the interpreting radiologist. In this course, we will discuss the appropriate use of various imaging tools for common pathologies such as pneumonia, stroke, liver cancer, breast cancer, and lung cancer. Our speakers will be presenting the most current evidence-based imaging guidelines and algorithms which are intended to assist both radiologists and clinicians in order to make timely and accurate medical decisions. We will hear these guidelines not from one person but from a team of experts from various fields of radiologic disciplines. The practice of radiology has certainly evolved. Although we embrace advances in technology, we must also embrace the clinical integration and new fields of subspecialization which adds value to the overall patient care. We thank you for being with us year after year as St. Luke's Medical Center brings to you our own version of celebrating this special event. Happy International Day of Radiology to everyone! Pneumonia is the single largest infectious cause of death in children worldwide and has killed almost 740,000 children under the age of 5 in 2019, according to WHO. This accounts for 14% of all deaths of children under 5 years old, but 22% of all deaths in children aged 1 to 5. It affects children and families everywhere, but deaths are highest in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Pneumonia may be caused by viruses, bacteria, and fungi, and this can be prevented with timely detection, simple interventions, and treated with low-cost medication and care. To discuss further, from the Department of Pediatric Radiology, let me introduce our team of experts in this field, Dr. Nathan David P. Concepcion, Dr. Maricar P. Reyes, Dr. Justin Luke D. Yap, Dr. Dexter Ferrer, and Dr. Ingrid Valerie Fomorka. Good day, everyone. For the next 23 minutes, I, Dr. Maricar P. Reyes, together with Dr. Nathan David Concepcion, Justin Luke Yap, John Dexter Ferrer, and Ingrid Valerie Fomorka, will discuss radiology practice guidelines and algorithms for childhood pneumonia. 
we have no significant disclosure with regard to this lecture. The objectives of this lecture are to review the different imaging modalities used in the evaluation of lower respiratory tract infections in children, discuss a few cases showing acute and chronic imaging manifestations of lower respiratory tract infections in children, using systematic and evidence-based diagnostic imaging recommendations and algorithms. Lower respiratory tract infection in children is a spectrum of illness that may affect the peripheral airways or the alveoli. It can occur sequentially or simultaneously. The etiologies of lower respiratory tract infection include various organisms such as viruses, bacteria, bacteria-like organisms, mycobacteria, fungi, and parasites. Mixed pathogens can also occur. Among hospitalized patients with pneumonia, approximately 26 to 35 percent have mixed pathogens of various combinations, believed to function synergistically and likely enhancing the severity of infection. Medical imaging has been used to confirm or exclude the presence of pneumonia, but it is also helpful in the evaluation of recurrent or persistent abnormalities, in the assessment of acute and chronic complications, and to exclude other underlying pathologic processes. It's important to take note that imaging is not recommended in immunocompetent children with suspected and complicated community-acquired pneumonia responding to treatment or does not require hospitalization. The chest x-ray is widely available and the imaging examination performed most frequently. It is usually appropriate for children less than three years old with fever of unknown origin and respiratory symptoms. In immunocompetent children with community-acquired pneumonia not responding to outpatient treatment or requiring hospitalization. In immunocompetent children with suspected hospital-acquired pneumonia. In immunocompromised children with fever or respiratory symptoms. And in children with suspected tuberculosis. A frontal projection of the chest either in AP or PA view, is usually sufficient to demonstrate presence of lung opacities. But a lateral view is also recommended in children to better detect other associated findings such as lymphadenopathy and minimal pleural effusion. A lateral decubitus view also may be obtained in some cases to assess presence of minimal free pleural fluid and to differentiate a loculated from a non-loculated pleural effusion. Important to take note that there is a low specificity of imaging findings, which makes the evaluation of pediatric patients with suspected pulmonary infections challenging because of various potential causes that have similar radiographic characteristics. CT scan is appropriate for immunocompromised children when chest x-ray is equivocal. For immunocompetent children with pneumonia complications seen on chest x-ray, and for immunocompetent children with recurrent or persistent pneumonia seen on chest x-ray. Ultrasound may be appropriate as an alternative in immunocompetent children with community-acquired pneumonia that does not respond to outpatient treatment or requiring hospitalization. In immunocompetent children with suspected hospital-acquired pneumonia, and in cases of lymphadenopathy in suspected TB patients. It's important to emphasize that although ultrasound is primarily used in the evaluation of pleural fluid, it has other utilization in the chest such as demonstrating lung consolidation, lymphadenopathies, and complications such as necrotizing pneumonia, abscess, and empyema. 
MRI is best for mediastinal and chest wall lesions. It can be an alternative to CT scan for immunocompetent children with suspected lung abscess by chest X-ray. And with the development of various technological advances in the imaging protocols, with cardiac and respiratory gating as well as motion correction, the lungs can now be examined better than before in MRI. Pathologic processes with high fluid content, such as pneumonia, pulmonary edema, pleural and pericardial effusion are readily seen on MRI. We will now go to different cases that will be presented by our pediatric radiology fellows, Dr. Siap, Ferrer, and Famorca. A pleasant day to all. I am John Dexter Ferrer and I will be presenting the first case for Practice, Guideline, and Algorithms of Childhood Pneumonia. We have a 12-year-old patient who was admitted as a case of metal diverticulum, status post ileal resection with end-to-end -end anastomosis, initially presenting as non-virus vomiting and hypogastric pain. On her seventh post-operative uh, day, which was her tenth day of admission, patients started to have non-productive cough, episodes with associated fever, tachypnea, and oxygen desaturation to room air. Upon assessment, there were decreased breath sounds on the right lung field, with coarse cows on the right upper lobe and clear left lung field. Test X ray was done, revealing near complete opacification of the right hemithorax, with obscuration of the ipsilateral cardiac border, hemidiaphragm, and lateral vasopulic circuit, which was ascribed to moderate to massive right sided plural effusion. Underlying pneumonia and or atelectasis, or even mass lesion, was not ruled out. It was then uh, antibiotics were suggested at the time, then oxygen supplementation was started. On uh, the, the day after, ultrasound test was done where in scanning in the right hemithorax showed hepatization of the right lung, seen as tissue-like echo texture of the lung, the lung parenchyma similar to the liver, with interspersed hyperechogenicities like the air gram. There is flow and color doppler interrogation. No clear effusion seen. These findings were signed out as consolidation of electrosis of the right lung. Succeeding post-operative days revealed better patient disposition with decrease in the episodes of cough and with no complaints of difficulty of breathing. There were still fever episodes noted which uh, lies with antipyretic medication. There was better airflow upon assessment with better resonance in the right mid to lower lung on auscultation. Follow-up X-ray was done on the 14th uh, post-operative day showing the sole consolidation of electrosis in the right lung and blunting of the right posterior gutter, likely reflective of minimal pleural effusion and or thickening. The use of ultrasound in this case of pneumonia was beneficial in the sense that it gave a better imagery of the underlying lung pathology as compared with the radiographs. In children, this is made possible because of the thinning of the chest thoracic walls and large volumes of the lungs in compared to adults. We were able to appreciate the normal parenchymal echotexture compared to its adjacent solid abdominal organ as seen in the left hemithorax. Likewise, we were able to identify consolidation and the atelectatic changes of the lung parenchyma and rule out presence of pleural effusion, which is a possible complication of pneumonia, all while keeping the patient from unnecessary preparations and radiation exposure for more advanced imaging modalities. This concludes my case presentation of evaluation of pneumonia in a child using ultrasonography. Thank you. Present day to everyone. I am Dr. Tomarca and I will be presenting the next case. For this case, we are presented with a 13 year old boy who came in with a chief complaint of abdominal pain accompanied with difficulty of breathing. History of present illness started with occasional cough two weeks prior to consult, which persisted to easy fatigability after one week. Few hours prior to consult, there was abdominal pain accompanied by difficulty of breathing, which prompted ER consult. Chest X-ray was requested and done. Initial X-ray findings showed a rounded soft tissue density in the left lower lobe while the rest of the lungs showed no other definite capacities. This was signed out as soft tissue density in the left lower lobe, which is non-specific 
what could be a consideration at a legacies or a mass fiction for which a contrast CT scan was recommended. A contrast chest CT scan revealed a lobulated opacity in the left lower lobe measuring about 4.9 by 5 by 5 cm. Pulmonary vessels were observed to cause three radiation without mass effect. No evidence of necrosis or abnormal calcification were identified. Other pertinent findings are hazy and tiny nodular densities in the left apex, superior left upper lobe, and to a lesser degree, the posterior right upper lobe. Slightly enlarged lymph nodes in both hyalur regions. Smaller nodes are likewise identified in the preterinal and both axillary regions. These findings are more in keeping with an infectious process rather than in the plastic process. Repeat X-ray was done after two weeks of antibiotic treatment, which revealed interval non-demonstration of the previously noted round soft tissue density in the left lower lobe. The lungs were well irritated without focal opacities. One of the various imaging manifestations of community-acquired pneumonia in the pediatric age group is a round opacity on chest radiograph. This appearance is termed round pneumonia and is most commonly caused by bacteria. In a study published by Restrepo et al., it was noted that 75% were seen in patients younger than 8 years of age and 90% were younger than 12 years. The mean age was at 5 years. The typical radiographic presentation of the solitary round region located in the posterior lower lobe was seen in 63% of the patients in the series by Kim and Donnelly. CT scans provide more detailed information than plain radiographs, but the principles of image genetic campaign must always be kept in mind. Cross sectional imaging with CT should be considered in the presence of a round opacity on chest radiographs in the following instances as published by Restrepo et al. Number one, if the clinical features are not consistent with the pneumonia process. Second, if the round opacity does not resolve after appropriate antibiotic treatment. And lastly, if there are radiographic signs of a non-pulmonary origin on chest radiograph. Round opacities in chest radiograph can be a manifestation of other conditions in children, such as congenital anomalies. Developmental pulmonary malformations such as sequestration and bronchogenesis can present as a round opacity and be mistaken for round pneumonia because they have a predilection to the lower lobes. However, on CT imaging, they can be distinguished through its connection to the tracheal bronchial tree and arterial supply. This ends my presentation. On to the last case. Thank you for listening. A pleasant day to everyone. I am Justin Lupia, a pediatric radiology fellow, and this is the third case. We have a four-year-old female presented with one-month cough associated with low-grade fever and progressive dyspnea. SOS consult and was noted to have decreased bed sounds in the left, and the laboratory workup suggested that there is an ongoing bacterial infection. Preliminary films done showed complete opacification of the left hemithorax. Thus, Big film chest catheter insertion was done for pleural effusion. Subsequent films, however, showed no improvement with interval development of gas lock fields centrally. A contest enhanced CT scan was then ordered, which showed the classic split pleural sign consistent with antiuma. The center of gas loculations suggests the presence of bronchopleural fistula, thus, the diagnosis of tecotizing pneumonia was entertained given the, these pertinent findings. Chest tube was reinserted and antibiotic treatment was revised to hasten patient's recovery. Patient improved and was subsequently discharged. A follow-up done after five months revealed significant improvement with minimal residual left pleural thickening. At this time, patient was asymptomatic. The value of doing CT scan in suspected cases of necrotizing pneumonia is well emphasized in this patient. Early infection of complications and other infectious, non infectious related pathologies can improve management and overall prognosis of our patients. Thus, in the appropriate clinical setting, it should be considered as a vital tool in problem solving. MRI, although not as commonly utilized, may also be beneficial in certain cases. A goal directed approach to reduce scan times may help focusing on particular findings 
such as the reverse target sign, which is only appreciated on MRI, as in, this, as in the following example. Figure 1 shows a hypointense rim with an area of central necrosis and surrounded by infiltration, which are hyperintense characteristic of the reverse target sign, as seen in necrotizing pneumonia. Figure 2 and 3 are contrast CT scan cuts in mediastinal and long window setting, showing the same lesions as solid enhancing nodules, thus missing the diagnosis of necrotizing pneumonia. That is the last case, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reyes, for the introduction of our topic and to the fellows in training for those wonderful cases. I'll be continuing on our talk on the practice guidelines and algorithms for childhood pneumonia. But before that, I'll be giving you a teaser. Which among these pneumonias is bacterial? A, B, C, or D, all of the above. If you chose A, it's actually viral. B is actually TB, and C is the only bacterial pneumonia in the group. Let's start with viral pneumonia. It has a broad range of chest radiographic changes listed below, and it starts with normal. It can also be from hyperation with increased interstitial markings, could have subsegmental atelectasis, it could have focal airspace opacities or consolidation or diffuse and bilateral opacities. Actually, the most common presentation of a viral disease is consolidation. How about TB disease? Lymphadenopathy is the radiologic hallmark, but not pathognomonic. Could be without or with parenchymal opacities or pneumonia. We all know that TB can have complications, namely lymphobronchial, miliary, cavitary, and extrapulmonary spread. This is an example of a one-year-old boy with chronic cough showing consolidation in the middle lobe, presenting with the classic silhouette sign obscuring the right parahardia margin. And on the lateral view, there's a donut sign representing hilar and mediastinal adenopathy. Another patient with enlarged lymph nodes in both sides, causing leftward deviation of the tracheal shadow and narrowing of the left main bronchus. Follow-up CT shows the classic central necrosis with peripheral rim enhancement of the enlarged matted lymph nodes and the coronal lung window confirms the narrowing of the left main bronchus. How about bacterial pneumonia? We know that it has varied presentations, but it's important to note that interstitial pattern can also be seen. Complications listed below are also expected. These are varied Presentation showing lobar, segmental, and multifocal opacities with bilateral consolidation and bilateral fluffy opacities. Here is an example of a complicated case with multiple air fluid levels in the right lung. A follow-up CT scan is the recommended study of choice, showing a dense fluid collection with thick walls and also air fluid levels compatible with lung abscess. A CT scan with IV contrast is also needed for persistent or recurrent pneumonias such as these cases. And the first case on your left side shows a duplication cyst postulated to be causing aspiration, thereby causing persistent or recurrent pneumonias. The case in the middle is an infected CPAM that's causing the persistent opacity in the left lower lobe. On the last case, on the right lower lobe, there's an opacity with an arterial supply coming from the aorta compatible with pulmonary sequestration. How about ultrasound? 
The most common use of ultrasound is for characterization of pleural effusion. But we know that ultrasound has also other functions. It can evaluate the peripheral pathologies, especially consolidation, and also presence of pneumothorax. Nowadays, ultrasound is becoming universal in the detection of mediastinal adenopathy, especially in children with tuberculosis in endemic places. And even if it's not for pneumonia, ultrasound is also good for the evaluation of the diaphragm. Here's an example of mediastinal ultrasound for lymphadenopathy showing superior vena cava and adjacent hypoechoic, probably necrotic, in large lymph nodes. And if you can correlate, confirms the same findings. Let's go to MRI. MRI is an alternative to CT scan for immunocompetent children with suspected lung abscess by chest x-ray. It is especially good for patients not requiring sedation or usually six years old and above. Now with rapid lung MRI sequences listed below, along with respiratory and ECG gating, the lungs are now better evaluated on MRI. These are some MRI images showing pleural effusion with lymphadenopathy, empyema, consolidation, and cavitation. So here's an algorithm of imaging recommendations for childhood pneumonia. And as you can see, chest x-ray is still the initial imaging choice for these situations listed here. And ultrasound is said to be appropriate but an alternative. If chest x-ray shows complications, ultrasound can be done to evaluate moderate to large pleural effusion, but in low resource settings, lateral decubitus chest x-ray, or in high resource settings, chest CT with IV contrast can be done. For suspected lung abscess, chest CT with IV is the modality of choice, but Again, in low resource setting, chest ultrasound, and in high resource setting, chest MRI are also appropriate. Respected bronchopleural fistulas require chest CT with IV contrast, as well as persistent and recurrent chest radiographic findings. Same here, chest CT with IV contrast. Lastly, for immunocompromised children, with respiratory symptoms but with equivocal chest x-ray findings or with multiple diffuse or confluent opacities seen on x-ray, chest CT scan without IV contrast is recommended but you can also use contrast if preferred. Some take-home points. Again, imaging is not recommended in immunocompetent children with uncomplicated community-acquired pneumonia responding to treatment or not requiring hospitalization. This is because whatever the result of the imaging does not change the management. Imaging, especially chest x-ray, has low specificity in that various causes can have similar radiographic characteristics. Ultrasound is not only for pleural effusion, CT scan is the imaging study of choice for complications and persistent recurrent pneumonias. And MRI, especially for children not requiring sedation, may be used as an alternative to CT scan. For more details, you can scan the QR code and download the following article recently published. And with that, Dr. Reyes, Dr. Ferrer, Pamorka, Yap, and myself, thank you all for your attention. Excellent lecture! Thank you so much doctors for sharing with us the updated protocols and guidelines we can use for our current practice, especially concerning childhood pneumonia, which we commonly encounter in our professions almost every day. To our audience, this is just the first of the five presentations we have in store for you tonight. Stay tuned!
Stroke remains the leading cause of disability and death in the Philippines. The philosophical tenet, time is brain, emphasizes the human nervous tissue is rapidly lost as stroke progresses and emergent evaluation and therapy are required. Our next group of experts will share to us their vital role and up-to-date approach in the diagnostics and treatment of stroke. From the section of Neuroradiology, let us welcome Dr. Ron Pilutin, Dr. Maria Christine Mendoza, Dr. Victor Erwin Hoxon, Dr. Lourdes Tan Aguas, and Dr. Agatha Christie Chavez. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Lulu Tan, and with me today are our colleagues in the Neuroradiology section of St. Luke's Medical Center to discuss the most important facets and questions in stroke imaging, and to emphasize our role as radiologists in brain attack imaging. Dr. Ron Pilatin, our section chief, and Dr. Agatha Chavez, our neuroradiology fellow, will join us in this panel. Hi, doctors. Hello. <laughs> so it's nice to see each other in face-to-face -face again. We're glad to have our stroke specialist, Dr. Ma'an. Hi, Lou. Hi, and we, our neurointerventionist, Dr. Erwin Hoxon. Hello. Hi. Hi. So we will both be shedding the light on our most burning questions. So I think most of us are familiar with brain attacks and its imaging algorithms and have found ourselves dealing with stroke patients in all shapes and sizes. But I think a lot of people will always ask us what the modality of choice is when it comes to initial imaging. Doc Ma'an, is it CT or MR or does it even matter? Um, for parenchymal imaging, CT and MRI are both reasonable for initial evaluation. But in choosing the modality, we always have to keep in mind the dictum in, ischemic, in acute ischemic stroke, which is time is brain. As benefit of intervention diminishes significantly or even is lost after certain time has elapsed. So we have this time windows of treatment um, wherein we can give certain interventions. And for us to be able to initiate therapy during this time windows, um, there's actually a recommendation of when we should be imaging our patients in the acute stage of stroke. So the recommendation currently would be from presentation to the um, ER until the initiation of imaging, it should be done within 20 minutes. And from presentation to interpretation would be about 45 minutes. So in our setting, um, what precludes usually MRI from being used as the initial imaging of um, choice is because again of time, and also of availability because as we know in most of our hospitals here in the Philippines um, not everybody has MRI 24-7 so usually um, what will be utilized would be the CT scan CT scan um, the information that we get there is actually sufficient already um, to know if the patient will be eligible at least by imaging um, to be thrombolyzed are there any other findings we have to note, especially if the clinicians are contemplating a certain uh, therapeutic strategy? For the first 4.5 hours, so the therapeutic strategy would be the administration of RTPA. Okay. And you just, they would really just want to know if there's an absent contraindication to, to doing that. So that would be um, looking for presence of acute intracranial hemorrhage in any compartment of the brain. So um, just to give our um, younger colleagues here, in CT scan, acute intracranial hemorrhage would appear as a hyperdensity. Um, here presented in this slide would be hyperdensity in the parenchyma, particularly in the left striatocapsular region with attenuation value of about 60 to 80 pounds per unit in, in the acute phase. Um, for MRI, we have to note that if it's in the acute phase, usually this will um, appear as an ISO intensity in T1 and you would only see the susceptibility signal in GR in the periphery because the degradation of blood products starts in the periphery. Another thing that they would want to note um, also in the, C in the initial CT scan would be if there is presence of frank hypodensity in more than one third of the um, vascular territory, particularly of the MCA, if it's an MCA infarct. Um, because as 
as um, CT scan is less sensitive than MRI, only about 30% will be showing signs of ischemia in the first three hours. And if there is established um, hypodensity in a big part of the territory, it may indicate that probably the stroke has already started more than three hours ago and thrombolysis may not be effective in lysing that and it may also pose um, some um, complications such as hemorrhagic conversion. So Doc, how do we really like determine what one third is? How do we determine the extent of the infarction? So determination is quite arbitrary. That's why there was development of um, scoring systems um, to know the extent of involvement of an arterial territory in stroke. So the most common that we use would be ASPECS or the Alberta Stroke Program CT score. For the MCA territory as projected here, um, we look at 10 areas that is supplied by the MCA and um, see its involvement. Usually what we look for would be the early infarct signs, of course, okay. of um, hypoattenuation, loss of gray-white matter, differentiation, total effacement. And once you already determine which areas are involved, you just subtract that to 10 to determine your aspect score. And for MCA, um, scores more than um, um, scores of 6 to 10 is associated with greater extent of benefit from thrombolysis and thrombectomy, while scores less than 6 is correlated with, with poor functional outcome and also an increased risk of ICH after um, reperfusion therapy. So patients with basilar artery occlusion with posterior circulation aspects of more than 5 could benefit from endovascular therapy. And the baseline um, aspect appears to be more important for decision making and predicting prognosis um, than time to endovascular therapy. Mm, I see. So CT really is fast and convenient for the assessment of stroke. But sometimes we know it's hard to assess it during early stroke. So where does MRI come into play? So there are institutions with dedicated stroke team and workflow that can expedite scanning of suspected stroke patients <coughs> and can use MRI as the initial imaging modality. As we know, MRI is more sensitive in the detection of infarction in very early time points, particularly the sequence that is very important for acute ischemic stroke, BWI and ADC. It is approximately four to five times more sensitive compared to non-enhanced CT, especially in the first six hours of stroke onset, which is actually the very critical hours. So an example would be this particular patient, just to show you how sensitive MRI is. It's a 50-year-old female who presented with left-sided weakness and slurring of speech with an ictus of about two hours. Ischemic stroke is suspected by physical examination. So CT was initially done. And here in this particular site, you can really not see a definite hypodensity, even though there is definite symptoms for this patient. Um, luckily, they were able to do an MRI about 20 minutes after the CT. And here we can see the definite restricted diffusion along the right MCA territory, suggestive of hyperacute infarct. So another important utilization of MRI is in cases of what is termed wake-up stroke or stroke of anterior time onset. So take for example this particular patient, an 80-year-old male who was last seen well at 4 a.m. but woke up at around 7 a.m. complaining of right-sided weakness. Um, what we look for in such cases is what is termed the DWI flare mismatch or presence of restricted diffusion in DWI and ADC but you do not see definite corresponding hyperintensity in flare. So this is an imaging surrogate that identifies patients that likely presents within the 4.5 hour stroke onset and may still be eligible for thrombolytic therapy. So as you can see in this patient, um, there is restricted diffusion, but you cannot see flare hyperintensity. They decided to do um, thrombolysis um, even if the ictus is unclear and this patient actually this is um, the follow-up imaging which is done 24 hours post RTPA there was no um, intracranial hemorrhage that developed and on discharge from a presentation of NIHSS of 10 the patient had NIHSS 2 on discharge just to emphasize we can still use MRI as um, initial imaging evaluation if the institution is capable of expediting scanning and 
um, particularly, for example, in our institution, we also set a back protocol so that we can shorten the time but still have the essential sequences done that is very important in diagnosis and also in decision making. So the total time would be around 14 to 15 minutes of scanning. So we have seen the importance of the conventional imaging and stroke, especially uh, there is a time component involved. Um, man, is there a advantage of the advanced neuroimaging, like uh, perfusion imaging? So for conventional imaging of the parenchyma, what we look for for the diagnosis of acute ischemic stroke, as mentioned already by Lulu, is the hypodensity in CT and the restricted diffusion in MRI. These are the widely accepted surrogate for the core or the irreversibly infarcted brain tissue. However, the target of reperfusion therapy actually in ischemic stroke is the potentially salvageable ischemic tissue or what is called the penumbra, which cannot be detected by conventional imaging. And this, is, this penumbra is demonstrated by the performance of perfusion imaging. Um, there was a time when the perfusion imaging was dropped from the recommendation for acute ischemic stroke, but there was re-emergence in the use of um, perfusion imaging um, because of the landmark trials of Diffuse 3 and Dawn, which included CT, perfu CT or MR perfusion in their parameters to determine who would be eligible um, to undergo thrombectomy in the extended time period, which is within, which is beyond the six hours um, window for thrombectomy. Um, what they use in this particular trial is an automated application, particularly rapid. Um, as seen in this slide, it can provide you the information that is needed in the eligibility criteria. It can give you an idea of the core and penumbra through the qualitative maps and also determine quantitative values that are needed such as the ischemic core or the core volume, the mismatch volume, and the mismatch ratio. Okay, thanks Doc Maan. At least now, the roles of CT and MRI have been clarified and other pertinent findings, such as the presence or absence of concomitant acute hemorrhage and the size of infarct, have also been emphasized. I wonder though, how should we deal with the vessels? We're lucky that Doc Irwin, our neurointerventionalist, is here to help us figure that out. Doc Irwin, what are the important things we have to note on the vascular side of things? Hi, Lulu. Thank you for asking that question. Very important, no? So, as Dr. Maan mentioned about the paramount importance of parenchymal imaging, us being able to see the early changes of ischemic uh, stroke in a patient, also the importance of ruling out the pertinent negatives, the hematomas, and also the extent or the severity of stroke. It's very important that we explore an important aspect of stroke imaging, which is the vascular imaging. So in this particular case, we're talking here about the documentation of the large vessel occlusion, or what we call the LVO. For the anterior circulation, large vessel occlusion means occlusion from the extracranial ICA up to M2. For the posterior circulation, large vessel occlusion means occlusion from the level of extracranial vertebral artery up to the basilar artery and the proximal PCA. We can document this by doing CT angiography or MR angiography, as you can see here. And this will be areas of vessel cutoff compatible to vascular territory of parenchymal abnormality. What is important is the inclusion of the extracranial ICA segment, especially from the origin, more so that this is a very important source of artery to artery embolism as one of the mechanisms of stroke. Okay, so we in St. Luke's, we do usually an MRA you know, together with our BAT protocol. Is there a specific protocol that we have to follow when you're looking at the vessels? Good question, uh, Agatha. No? Uh, it depends on your initial choice of imaging modality. Unfortunately, in many in situations, uh, the circle of wheel is the cow in the MRA yeah. typically will not involve the, the great vessels. Mm -hmm. That's why you will have to emphasize including that. But if the institution will be, uh, has a preference to use CT scan during the first six hours of stroke onset, then the single phase CTA would suffice. And typically the advantage of that is that you can have a single pass 
to include the origin of the great vessel. Mm -hmm. So, Doc, we're talking about the ano, no, the patients who present within the six hours. How about for those who come in later, mm -hmm. those with wake-up strokes and those late presenters? Agatha, it depends on the imaging modality chosen for the parenchymal imaging. We are quite familiar with the hyperdense MCA sign as well as the sylvian dot sign on CT cross-sectional imaging. We're also quite familiar with the vascular blooming artifacts for the MRI cross-sectional imaging. During the first six hours of acute stroke onset, if CT was the chosen imaging modality, then a single phase CTA will be enough to document the large vessel occlusion or the LVO. If MRI is the imaging modality chosen, then a non-contrast time of flight MRM geography should be enough to document the large vessel occlusion. Basically, when we're doing Vessel imaging, pragmatic approach would be for the purpose of clot retrieval and your cross-sectional imaging is for the purpose of timely institution of the IVTPA. During the first six hours of stroke, we're seeing less and less important use of advanced neuroimaging because essentially you're using this to exclude patient from mechanical thrombectomy with unnecessary delays. In fact, the most thrombectomy capable centers all across the globe are using this pragmatic approach in parenchymal and vessel imaging during the first six hours of acute stroke onset. In this particular example, you can see here the hyperdense MCA as seen by the arrow. A single phase CTA was done showing this filling defect within this area of the M1 MCA. An angiogram was performed for double setup mechanical thrombectomy. Pointed here by the arrow will be the absence of flow within the M1 MCA. And this here is the appearance post-mechanical thrombectomy showing complete recanalization and reperfusion within this area of the hemisphere. How we are modifying the protocols for this kind of situations, patient coming in late outside the golden time window, and we want to offer them any intervention. So as far as vessel imaging is concerned, the typical single phase CT angiography, if we're talking about CT as a preference for vessel imaging, then we can now do multiphasic CTA. The good thing about this is that this is only considered as intermediate neuroimaging without an added further delay in the stroke workflow. And also important is that multiphasic CT angiography can be performed in many CT scanners in the country. For our younger colleagues, the importance of this is that we can assess the robust collateral uh, for this patient, meaning for any patient having an occlusive point in any portion of the MCA, of course we have there the, the core and you have there the penumbra. These are the things we presume to see in an absence of advanced neuroimaging. But the intermediate neuroimaging in a form of multiphasic CTA, we can assess the integrity of the collateral that will be sustaining this penumbra. Basically, these are the collaterals that will either uh, delay the progression of the core or they're the ones that will be freezing the penumbra such that intervention can be performed at the late time window. The idea is that these temporal phases will be catching the robust collateral formation wherein we, ha we can assess the integrity of uh, each patient's unique uh, collaterals where if they can sustain uh, intervention beyond six hours. Okay. So Erwin, you, you mentioned about the endovascular uh, intervention, particularly the ischemic stroke cases. Uh, how does this affect our uh, brain attack algorithm for stroke triage and management? The 2016 landmark trials on stroke endovascular care have totally changed the way we deal with stroke today. It has totally changed the landscape of stroke management. We now have fully understood the impact of large vessel occlusion or LVO to this kind of patients. In fact, because mechanical thrombectomy is so efficient, we now tend to do mechanical thrombectomy outside the golden time window. As you can see here, outside these landmark trials, we have the positive trials of Dawn, electing mechanical thrombectomy up to 24 hours. We have the deficit street trial being positive, electing mechanical thrombectomy up to 16 hours. So let's say the patient will be presenting 
beyond six hours, let's say at seventh hour, and having an aspect score of eight, mm -hmm. it only tells me that this patient may have two characteristics. This patient may, may not be a fast progressor, or this patient may have a good collaterals. But we need ob objective proof of this collateral assessment for this patient. Typically, if you assess the three phases of the MCTA, if there's, you see a point of occlusion. The second phase, if you see a symmetric uh, reconstitution of the collaterals compared to the normal side, then it means that you don't have a delay. This patient has a grade five collaterals. If the patient only has uh, on a subsequent phase, a feeling of the collaterals catching up with the normal side, and you only have one delay, then it's a grade four collateral. Then this patient, the combination of good grade collaterals, grade four or five, in combination with a good aspect score, at least aspect score of six beyond six hours, then this patient, at the very least, will benefit from mechanical thrombectomy. At least you don't harm the patient. Okay, so now that we're uh, talking about a lot of uh, advancement in the uh, stroke imaging that will allow us to extend the window for treatment, especially in late presenters, uh, where do you see us going? What does the future hold for the stroke uh, care? Now, we, because we know that we're talking here about changing the lives of this patient from the dismal outcome of vascular artery occlusions and potentially fatal posterior circulation LVOs. I think that's now the biggest game changer that we are now anticipating after the publication of the attention in the Bauchi trial. It now means that we can efficiently do, me do mechanical thrombectomy as well to preserve circulation the way we do it in the anterior circulation. Wow, it looks like we've come a really long way in expanding the eligibility of stroke patients for thrombectomy. Yeah, but uh, you know, uh, to keep us uh, with this advancement, we have to continuously improve our skills in detecting strokes and reporting all of the relevant uh, information that our clinicians need you know, in choosing the most appropriate uh, treatment for our patients. Uh, so, Ab, since you're our fellow in training in your radiology, why don't you summarize for everybody what you've learned today? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ron, and thank you to Dr. Maan and to Dr. Irwin for clarifying a lot of our questions about how we image stroke and our role as radiologists, no? especially in the BAT or BAT team. Okay, so basically, we're, um, we have to remember, again, as Dr. Maan said, the time is brain, so we have to maximize the imaging modalities that uh, are available to us in our institutions, no? and that advances in endovascular techniques are not only expanding the eligibility you know, of our patients for thrombectomy, but also already requiring us to be more adept in interpreting our findings on parenchymal imaging and vascular imaging. We must also remember that we as radiologists play a very important role in clinical decision making as to the management of our patients. So we must be able to answer our clinicians' questions about whether or not our patient has an acute intracranial bleed via CT and MRI, especially since an acute bleed will disqualify the patient from RTPA treatment. We should also be able to age and estimate the extent of the infarct remembering that strokes covering less than one-third of a vascular territory or those with an aspect score of more than six are eligible for intravenous RTPA. We must also be able to identify large vessel occlusions in angiographic studies, particularly from the origin of the extracranial internal carotid artery up to the M2 segment of the middle cerebral artery in the anterior circulation and the extracranial basilar artery up to the proximal posterior cerebral artery in the posterior circulation since these patients are more likely to benefit from mechanical thrombectomy. Ultimately, it is our ability to answer these questions timely and accurately that will really go a long way in expediting the appropriate treatment for our patients. And with that very concise summary from AGS, we have finished our session on stroke FAQs. So we hope that we have clarified our role as radiologists in brain attack imaging and have streamlined the important clinical information that we must provide to our clinicians to serve our patients better. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Until next time. Thank you very much for a very engaging lecture from the section of neuroradiology. 
as they have highlighted the essentials of stroke detection and its current guidelines. So we have heard two great lectures that we commonly encounter in our practice, and there are three more to go. We will have a short break, but stay on your seats as we tackle more current updates and guidelines for our practice. The Institute of Radiology would like to thank our partners for this special event, GE Healthcare and Menorini.
What the world needs now is people. People who see things just a little bit differently. Who go out of their way to find a new perspective and a new way forward. People who make faraway places feel closer with flight that's more fuel efficient. Who put the focus of healthcare where it belongs on making patients healthier. People who see how more sustainable energy can power daily life while powering progress. Because seeing a smarter, healthier, cleaner world isn't something that's far in the future. It's something we're building now. GE, building a world that works. Beyond Imaging Healthcare is experiencing a dynamic transformation. Advanced technologies are revolutionizing clinical, operational and financial outcomes to solve cost, quality and access challenges. Change is made possible by growth of IoT, greater computing power, secure networks, democratized cloud storage, real-time data analytics. Adaptive UX technologies will actively sense, learn, and transform environments. Integrated imaging devices will be aware, intuitive, and predictive. Artificial intelligence will provide an elevated experience across the imaging value chain. The result? A new era in personalized, patient-centered care, delivering improved outcomes. This is the future of imaging we are working to create.
rebound and the fastest economic growth achieved is also witnessing the fastest growth in the healthcare sector which is why we've established our presence and positioned ourselves as the partner of choice to bring important healthcare brands across the region Menorini Asia Pacific as part of a leading global biopharmaceutical company Menorini Asia Pacific's capabilities span the entire pharmaceutical development life cycle a fully integrated biopharmaceutical company capable of research development manufacturing regulatory affairs and commercialization beyond end-to-end -end capabilities and cross-functional expertise Menorini Asia Pacific has also become the preferred partner for leading healthcare companies around the world our expertise in building healthcare brands flexible business model and dedicated alliance management to create value for our partners have enabled us to make strategic acquisitions and licensing arrangements consequently taking many brands to greater heights our rapidly growing businesses are bolstered by over 3,300 sales marketing and support professionals operating in 13 key markets our sales and marketing strategies underpinned by local patient and physician insights have helped many companies with varying needs tap into the Asia-Pacific growth story. Whether for new brands or line extensions, Pharmaceutical or biotechnology companies can gain rapid market access to the region and manage their risks by leveraging on our strengths as a gateway to Asia Pacific. A reliable partner whose network and reach extends beyond the region with a strong track record offering unparalleled customer experience. Founded in 1886, the name Menorini has through the generations become synonymous with the mark of quality. A trusted biopharmaceutical company with a strong tradition in partnering, an established presence in over 100 countries with more than 16,000 employees, Menorini is bringing its illustrious heritage and compelling values into the next century. And here in Asia Pacific, our ongoing commitment is to deliver quality healthcare brands, invigorating lives across the region. Your partner, your brand, at your service. Menorini, Asia Pacific. Liver imaging is important in patients with a known or suspected malignancy because the liver is a common site of metastatic spread and also important in patients with chronic liver disease who are at risk for developing hepatocellular carcinoma. Hepatocellular carcinoma is one of the most common cancers worldwide. Its burden is the highest in the Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa due to HBV infections endemic in most new cases, up to 80% occurring in these areas. To present liver cancer imaging guidelines, we have the section of abdominal radiology, Dr. Brianne P. Paner, Dr. Joyce Comia, and Dr. Maria Angeline D. Nicandro.
Today, we will be discussing the typical imaging features of the three most common liver malignancies that we usually encounter in our practice. Here is a simplified approach in evaluating liver masses. Hepatic mass is categorized into solid or cystic lesions. Solid lesions are then classified into hypervascular and hypovascular lesions. Hypervascular liver tumors include HCC, FNH, hemangioma, adenoma, and metastasis. Hypovascular lesions include METS, cholangiocarcinoma, and infection. In this lecture, we're going to discuss the three most common liver malignancies. Cancer ranks as the leading cause of death. This chart shows the top 10 most common cancers, which account for more than 60% of the newly diagnosed cancer cases and more than 70% of the cancer deaths. Liver cancer is the sixth most commonly diagnosed cancer and the third most common cause of cancer death. Men are two to three times affected than women. It is estimated that HCC makes up 80% of primary liver cancer and cholangiocarcinoma comprising 15%. The incidence of liver metastases are more common than primary hepatic malignancies because the liver is a frequent site for metastasis. We will be discussing the typical imaging features of these three liver malignancies, focusing on CT and MRI. Liver metastases are the most common malignant liver masses, more common than primary hepatic malignancies. Most of the hepatic metastases are from primary sites in the gastrointestinal tract, mostly affecting older age group 50 and above. Metastatic malignancies have variable imaging features, can be hypovascular or hypervascular, which originate from primary sites as listed. On CT imaging, hypervascular metastasis appears hypodense on non-contrast CT with arterial enhancement and appear heterogeneous fading to isodensity in the delayed phase. Hypervascular metastases are best seen in the arterial phase, showing intense peripheral and heterogeneous enhancement and our eyes so to slightly hyperdense to the liver in the venous and delayed phases. On MRI, these are moderately T1 hypointense, usually T2 hyperintense, and may be cystic or necrotic with restricted diffusion. There's avid arterial enhancement, some are homogeneously enhancing, others are peripherally enhancing, and eyes so to slightly hyperintense to the liver parenchyma on the portal venous and delayed images. Most metastatic liver lesions are hypovascular, which appear hypodense to the normal liver and most conspicuous, conspicuous on portal venous space as opposed to hypervascular metastasis, which enhance intensely on the arterial face. Rim-like enhancement is the most characteristic appearance of hypovascular metastasis due to increased vascularity in the tumor periphery. On hepatic arterial phase, the outer margin of the metastasis, which is the most vascularized portion, shows mild early enhancement, enhancing prominently on the portal venous space with continuous regular peripheral enhancement and hypodense center. On the delayed phase, the outer margin shows a decrease in enhancement fading to near isodensity. On MRI, hypovascular mets appear as T1 low and T2 hyperintense with restricted diffusion. The lesions show target sign on T2 with central hyperintensity ascribed to necrosis. There is peripheral enhancement starting in the arterial phase, progressing in intensity in the venous and delayed phases. There is no uptake of contrast in the hepatocyte phase as metastatic tumors do not contain functioning hepatocytes. Next is hepatocellular carcinoma. HCC is the most common primary malignancy of the liver. It is higher among men than women. Incidence increases after age 40. Cirrhosis is the most important clinical risk factor. It is also associated with underlying hepatitis infection and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Fibrolamellar HCC is a more fibrotic subtype of hepatocellular carcinoma. It occurs in young adults 20 to 40 years of age, does not have association with cirrhosis, alcoholism, or hepatitis infection, it is not associated with increased serum alpha fetoprotein and usually large at presentation, heterogeneous with calcification, hemorrhage, or necrosis. HCC can be single or multiple liver nodules, massive nodules that may involve multiple liver segments or diffuse forms seen as multiple small nodules throughout the liver. On CT imaging, HCC is hypodense on non-contrast study showing heterogeneous mosaic arterial enhancement predominantly at the periphery, demonstrating early washout in the portal venous phase 
and hypodense to the liver on the delayed phase with central necrosis. An enhancing capsule is also noted in the delayed phase. The combination of arterial enhancement with venous washout, although not sensitive, is highly specific for the diagnosis of HCC. HCCs on MRI often show decreased T1 signal and mild T2 hyperintensity with restricted diffusion. There's avid enhancement on arterial phase with washout on venous and delayed images, and it appears hypointense on the 20-minute delayed phase. Other findings may include T1 and T2 hypointense tumor capsule and vascular invasion of portal or hepatic veins with, enhan with enhancing tumor thrombus. Next is cholangiocarcinoma. Cholangiocarcinoma is the second most primary malignant hepatic tumor. Mare male to female ratio is somewhat equal. Risk increases with age with peak incidence at 7 decade. Major risk factors are, are bile stasis and chronic inflammation of the biliary epithelium. Cholangiocarcinomas can be classified according to location, either intrahepatic or extrahepatic. Intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma appears as low attenuation solid mass in non-contrast CT with irregular peripheral arterial enhancement and progressive enhancement in the delayed phase due to tumor fibrosis. Subtle capsular retraction is also noted. MRI using liver-specific contrast shows a T2 hyperintense mass with central hypointensity from fibrosis. The mass also shows restricted diffusion. Arterial peripheral enhancement with progressive enhancement on the portal venous and delayed images and cloud-like central hyperintensity on the hepatocyte phase are noted. There is also mild capsular retraction and dilatation of the peripheral ducts. This one is an 81-year-old male suffering from anemia. Pertinent abdominal ultrasound finding is a large, lobulated, heterogeneous, predominantly hyperechoic mass with internal cystic focus located in the left lobe. Dynamic CT study shows a large, lobulated mass in the hepatic segments 4A and 4D, minimally extending into segment 8. The mass exhibits mosaic arterial enhancement now with more conspicuous central necrosis. There is rapid contrast washout in the portal venous phase. On the delayed phase, there is a faint trim of enhancement suggestive of a fibrotic capsule. Findings of a large hepatic mass with arterial enhancement, rapid washout in the portal venous phase, and appearance of a fibrotic capsule on the delayed phase are compatible with hepatocellular carcinoma. The mass abuts and splays the portal V. The bilateral intrahepatic ducts are mighty dilated from extrinsic compression by the hepatic mass. These findings are seen in the background of a mighty nodular hepatic contour suggestive of cirrhosis. The imaging findings are consistent with markedly elevated alpha fetal protein level. But see, fusion study demonstrates a large lobulated enhancing hypermetabolic mass centered at segments 4A and 4B. The most intense FPG uptake is seen in the left side of the mass. The central areas which have no FPG uptake correspond to the necrotic regions. Biopsy proves the presence of a moderately differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma. Next case is an 83 year old male with new endocrine transdifferentiation of prostate adenocarcinoma. He complained of easy fatigability and body weakness. A dynamic MR study, there is an ovulation at segment 6, which appears heterogeneously hyper intense in P2 and heterogeneously hypo-intense of P1. During arterial phase, the lesion shows peripheral nodular enhancement in continuous ring-like pattern. It exhibits progressive centripetal enhancement during portal venous and the late phases without regard to the blood pool. Findings are compatible with hypervascular metastasis. In retrospect, contrast-enhanced CT study taken two months prior to MR study, demonstrates no discrimination at segment 6. For our third and last case, we have a 37-year-old female with right-sided abdominal pain. Ultrasound of the abdomen revealed two well-delineated iso to hypoechoic hepatic lesions with hypoechoic cream 
seen in the right lobe. Dynamic liver study shows two adjacent hypodense lesions exhibiting heterogeneous gradual enhancement at hepatic segments E5 and 4. Associated mild peripheral biliary ectasia is appreciated in the same segments. Dynamic MR study using extracellular conscious agent was also done. The lesions appear heterogeneously hyperintense in P2 and demonstrates restricted diffusion at the periphery. The lesions exhibit gradual heterogeneous enhancement in surgical fashion. There is associated intrahepatic bile duct dilatation within the mass and adjacent liver. The anterior branch of the right portal vein is encased by the mass. The middle hepatic vein is effaced. The CT study shows two hypermetabolic hepatic lesions at segments 8, 5, and 4 with associated mild peripheral biliary ectasia. In biopsy revealed by focal, moderately differentiated cholangiocarcinoma. Just to summarize, let's quickly review the cases side by side. A large hepatic mass with basic arterial enhancement, rapid washout in the portal space, and appearance of capsule in the delayed phase is hepatocellular carcinoma, and the proven otherwise. A mass with peripheral continuous modular enhancement with centripetal progression they represent a hypervascular metastasis or cholangiocarcinoma. Other pertinent findings, such as biliary duct obstruction and satellite fusion, favor cholangiocarcinoma, while a history of primary malignancy may help clinch the diagnosis of hypervascular metastasis. You have just heard a comprehensive discussion of the typical imaging findings of the top three most common liver malignancies. Correlation of imaging findings with clinical and laboratory data, as well as patient demographics and risk factors play a key role in the diagnosis. The choice of imaging modality depends on machine and patient factors. Ultrasound is the most commonly used screening modality because it is widely available it is easy to operate, fast, inexpensive, and radiation-free. However, ultrasound is operator-dependent and has limited capacity to characterize hepatic mass. Dedicated CT scan and or MRI are needed to supplement the ultrasound findings. CT scan is more widely available than MRI. It requires less scanning time and less expensive than MRI. It can characterize hepatic mass but with limited soft tissue resolution, and it exposes the patient to radiation. MRI is the imaging modality of choice for evaluating liver mass because of its multiparametric and multiplanar capabilities. It provides superior soft tissue resolution as well as physiologic and morphologic information. MRI has a liver-specific conscious agent giving this modality an additional advantage. MRI is radiation-free. On the other hand, it is not as widely available as ultrasound and CT scan. It requires a relatively long scanning time, increasing the risk of artifacts. It is an expensive modality relative to ultrasound and CT scan. It is contraindicated in patients who cannot follow breathing instructions, cannot tolerate long scanning time, and with claustrophobia. Oftentimes, at least two imaging modalities are used to identify and characterize hepatic mass. It usually starts in screening with ultrasound, followed by a CT scan or MRI. If CT scan findings are equivocal, MRI is done to further evaluate the mass. The advent of dedicated CT and MR imaging studies and liver-specific conscious agents have avoided unnecessary biopsy and improved tumor staging and treatment algorithm. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was an exceptional lecture to tackle liver cancer imaging diagnosis. It was very insightful and we definitely gained a lot of refresher and new insight regarding imaging protocols for better management of patients with liver malignancy. Again, thank you. To our valued colleagues and guests, kindly hold on to your seats as you wouldn't want to miss the last two lectures we have for you tonight.
Breast cancer is still the number one cancer in women and one of the leading cause of death in our country and all over the world. In the country, there are 3 out of every 100 Filipino women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. Despite the efforts in campaigning for breast cancer, especially in our country, there are still a lot of people who lack awareness and the proper knowledge of the disease. Here with us are the breast imaging specialists to give us their insights and up-to-date approach and practice guidelines to address our concerns and the proper diagnosis of the disease. Let us welcome Dr. Barbara Helen Perez, Dr. Jason Paul Gadi, Dr. Michael Vincent Corsino, Dr. Mary Grace Azucena, and myself, Dr. Katleya Manlapa. This disease has changed millions of lives, and it will continue to change lives. Hi, my name is Dr. Jason Gaddy, and I am the head of the imaging section of the Breast Center at St. Luke's Medical Center, Quezon City. Today, we will talk about breast cancer and the imaging modalities we use to fight it. Worldwide, breast cancer is the leading type of cancer in women. In the Philippines, one in every 13 Filipino women would develop breast cancer in her lifetime, according to several reports from the DOH, Philippine Cancer Society, Philippine Medical Oncology, and other organizations. That is, 67 women are diagnosed with breast cancer every day. It is reported that the Philippines has the highest incidence rate of breast cancer in Asia. Therefore, breast cancer screening among Filipino women is of utmost importance. The goal of screening is to detect the disease at its earliest and most treatable stage. The assumption is that early detection will improve outcomes. Early breast cancer detection reduces death, extends life expectancy, and improves life quality. It also enables less extensive surgery, fewer mastectomies, and less frequent or aggressive chemotherapy. Currently in the Philippines, we do not have a population-based, government-driven screening program, so it is important to educate clinicians about the latest evidence-based recommendations for breast cancer screening. Up next to talk about international breast cancer screening guidelines is Dr. Grace Asusena. There are various society and expert recommendations for routine mammographic screening in women with average risk, meaning they have no family or personal history of breast cancer or exposure to radiation. The American College of Radiologists, Society of Breast Imaging, the American Congress of OBGYN, and others all recommend that women should start breast cancer screening at the age of 40. The reason behind this recommendation is because this results in the greatest mortality reduction, the most lives saved, and the most life years gained. The years of life lost to breast cancer are highest for women in their 40s. The largest and longest-running breast cancer screening trial by Dr. Laszlo Tabar, the Swedish two-country trial re-establishes that regular mammography screening decreases breast cancer deaths by a third in all women aged 40 and over. A report was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on July 2017 showing that younger women of screening age are more likely to develop aggressive breast cancers than older women. This risk of developing aggressive breast cancer reinforces why women should start annual mammography screening at age 40, allowing breast cancer to grow even for an extra year would increase the odds of a woman to die from breast cancer. Most guidelines recommend annual or biennial mammographic screening between 40 to 74 years for the average risk populations and annual mammography or annual MRI starting from a younger age for the high-risk populations. However, there are indeed discrepancies in screening in age, methods, and intervals among countries. And because of that, local adaptation is needed. 
I will now show some numbers we gather at the breast center in St. Luke's Medical Center. SLMC trends. From 2016 to 2020, a total number of 73,062 patients underwent screening mammography at the breast centers of St. Luke's Medical Center, Quezon City, and Global City. The table shows the breakdown per age group with the majority of patients coming in for screening in the less than 50-year-old groups. It is important to emphasize here that the most number of patients with Barrett's 4 and 5 are in this combined group of the 40 to 49-year-old patients. We even see patients in their 30s with Barrett's 4 and 5 category findings. But based on these numbers, there are more patients greater than 50 year old who underwent biopsy and thus have found to have cancer confirmed by histopathology in St. Luke's Medical Center. The next table shows the cancer detection rate per age group. Based on the American College of Radiology Byrad's Atlas 5th edition, the acceptable range of cancer detection rate for the screening mammography is 2.5 or more. As shown, the cancer detection rates in St. Luke's Medical Center for the different age groups are beyond the American College of Radiology benchmark. Next to be discussed is the simple algorithm for breast cancer screening in St. Luke's Medical Center. The algorithm we follow in SLMC, breast mammography or tomosynthesis, is done for patients over 40 years including patients with implants. If it is normal, the patient will continue with annual mammogram or tomosynthesis. If obscured nodules are observed, ultrasound is used to further characterize the lesion. This is important for women who have heterogeneously dense and extremely dense breasts which can hide masses. Patients with breast implants are also evaluated using 2D ultrasound. If there are abnormalities detected on ultrasound, tissue correlation is recommended for definitive diagnosis of the lesion. The options are excision biopsy with needle wire localization, ultrasound guided core needle biopsy or vacuum assisted core biopsy. If, on the other hand, suspicious calcifications are seen in mammogram or tomosynthesis, the next step in management would either be excision biopsy with needle wire localization and their mammographic guidance or stereotactic vacuum assisted core biopsy. For patients with breast augmentations such as silicone injections, breast MRI will be recommended for screening. Mammography plays a central role in early detection of breast cancers because it can show changes in the breast years before a patient or a physician can palpate them. The standard views of a mammogram are the craniocaudal and the mediolateral oblique views. With mammography, we can characterize breast composition and identify abnormalities that signal a disease process such as breast cancer in the form of masses, architectural distortion, calcifications, and abnormal lymph nodes. Mammography remains the gold standard for breast cancer screening but has well-established limitations such as tissue superimposition that is created by the overlap of normal breast structures. Tomography is a more advanced form of mammography which acquires projections of the breast from different angles and reconstructs them into a 3D volume set. It is shown to improve key screening parameters compared to digital mammography, specifically improvement of the recall rates and cancer detection rates. It demonstrates improved screening interpretation performance when combined with 2D digital mammography compared with 2D digital mammography alone. Here's a comparison of a 2D digital mammography and the digital breast tomosynthesis. These are the CC views of a patient taken on the same day. On 2D images, you can barely appreciate the lesion in the inner part of the right breast. However, on the 3D images, 
The nodule is more evident with the speculations clearly visible. The 3D image clearly shows an architectural distortion in the upper portion of the right breast, which is not visible on the two 2D images. This is an example of the ability of digital breast tomosynthesis to separate the overlapping breast tissues that can effectively hide the cancer. As discussed, mammography is the gold standard for screening and diagnosing breast cancer. Ultrasonography, on the other hand, is effective in detecting lesions and differentiating benign lesions from the malignant ones. Both of these modalities are effective in diagnosing breast cancer more accurately. It's been established that adding ultrasound as an adjunctive mammography increases the detection of cancer as it gives better images for characterization and analysis of masses. This affords increased chances of detecting cancer. Shown here is a 3D automated whole breast ultrasound that we use in the breast center since 2010. It utilizes a high frequency 14 MHz automated transducer with a 15 cm by 17 cm wide field of view. The transducer pod is placed on top of the breast and would then acquire high resolution volume data sets of the breast. This is the imaging output of the 3D automated breast ultrasound which provides sagittal, transverse, and coronal views. It is like virtually scanning the patient. The coronal view in particular is a unique way of viewing of the breast from the skin down to the chest wall, obtaining an anatomic view of a lesion. It is also excellent for evaluating architectural distortions, which were usually only seen on mammograms. All of these capabilities lessen the need to recall the patient to the breast center for a second look, thereby reducing patient anxiety. The example depicted here is a hypoechoic, non-parallel nodule in the transverse and sagittal projections. In the coronal plane, which is in the enlarged image, the speculated margins of the lesion is clearly demonstrated. For our next segment, Dr. Michael Cursino will discuss the role of breast MRI in cancer screening. MRI of the breast has the highest sensitivity for breast cancer detection among current clinical imaging modalities. The American Cancer Society recommends that all high-risk women or those with greater than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer have a breast MRI and a mammogram every year. The American College of Radiology and Society of Breast Imaging recently added the recommendation that breast MRI should be added as a screening test in women with previous diagnosis of breast cancer. In addition to its use for screening high-risk patients, other important indications for breast MRI are preoperative planning, neoadjuvant treatment monitoring, and evaluation of integrity of breast prosthesis. Last but not least, to talk about procedures we perform in the breast centers of St. Luke's, Quezon City, and Global City is Dr. Catlea Manlapas. When suspicious findings are demonstrated during screening with tomosynthesis or mammogram and additionally with ultrasound, tissue sampling is performed under guidance of the modality that detected them. Needle biopsies, both core and vacuum-assisted breast biopsies, are performed in the breast centers in Quezon City and Global City under ultrasound or mammographic guidance. Suspicious calcifications detected best on mammography or tomosynthesis are targeted and sampled in a minimally invasive stereotactic vacuum-assisted breast biopsy. Currently, St. Luke's is the only facility in the country with a prone stereotactic biopsy table which allows the patients to be positioned more comfortably and lessens syncope episodes. For calcifications beyond the reach of the stereotactic views, needle wire localization is performed under mammography guidance before patients are brought to the operating room for excision biopsy. On the other hand, nodules with suspicious features demonstrated in ultrasound can be biopsied using core needle or commonly done in both centers now. Suspicious nodules can be sampled and excised using vacuum-assisted breast biopsy. Lastly, needle localization of the suspicious nodule 
can also be done under ultrasound guidance before the patients are brought to the operating room for excision biopsy. The role of breast radiologists as being the first in the line of breast defense cannot be emphasized enough. I am Barbara Perez. I head the section of breast radiology at St. Luke's Medical Center Global City. After imaging is reviewed and correlated, findings are effectively communicated through a report. Each study is double read by two breast radiologists to improve breast cancer detection rates. A single BIRAD score is given to represent the most concerning finding in a study. Findings from several studies show that double reading results in lower recall rates and improved cancer detection rates. Another important practice we do in St. Luke's Medical Center is our regular radiopathologic conferences or monthly audit trails. This is to check the readings against the gold standard, which is histopathology. This gives a more comprehensive picture of the patient pathway. This is indeed a crucial practice for physicians in the breast center in achieving and maintaining best practices and outcomes. Lastly, it is important to keep track of the team's performance. Predictive values show how effective the current practice of breast radiology in this institution is. Our patients are important to us. Upholding these practices for early detection of breast cancer is foremost in our minds. This is our passion, our continued commitment. That was an excellent discussion with our breast radiology experts. The standardized approach in the diagnosis and early detection of breast cancer and the current practice guidelines were well explained to us. Gone are the days that the diagnosis of breast cancer is already a death sentence. But as our experts have shared to us, with the latest and better technology and proper approach in algorithm in diagnosing the disease, we will be better radiologists to help in the early detection of breast cancer where it is still curable. Again. Early detection is the best protection and there will be more treatment options and a better chance of survival. Lung cancer is the major cause of cancer death in men in the world and the second leading cause of cancer death in women worldwide. It is the most common cancer in the whole of Asia and most deadly cancer in the world. And the incidence of lung cancer has been increasing in Asia. Accurate assessment of disease extent is important in deciding the optimal treatment approach. As radiologists, it is necessary to understand the principles of staging and the implications of radiological findings on the various staging descriptors and eventual treatment decisions. For this final lecture, I present to you the section of thoracic radiology and our colleagues, Dr. Duranditas Z. Tadina and Dr. Gerald Galvin S. Lim. Hello everyone. For this segment, we will tackle imaging in lung cancer. The speakers have nothing to disclose. Lung cancer remains to be as the second leading cancer site following breast in our setting, and among the various histologic types, adenocarcinoma is still the most common, so we will focus this session in this spectrum. We will begin with some screening guidelines in pulmonary nodules, discuss the evolution of lung adenocarcinoma, and the relevant staging criteria. As these topics merit individual sessions on its own, we will not be diving into specifics. We will also do the discussion using sample cases. So a pulmonary nodule is an important finding of lung cancer. How to manage these has become essential, which explains why many guidelines exist. 
Basically, the protocols are different whether nodules are detected at screening programs or incidentally. Screening programs target high-risk subjects who need consistent monitoring, whereas incidentally detected lung nodules represent a different population that needs a varied clinical management. ACCP and Fleischner Society guidelines deal with incidental nodules, while the IEL cap and lung rats are protocols for screening programs. NCCN and British Thoracic Guidelines, meanwhile, state both issues with separate algorithms. Most guidelines have common components, which are risk factor assessment, nodule size, and nodule consistency. Nodules smaller than certain thresholds do not require routine follow-up. So the Nelson trial demonstrated that there's indeed benefit in doing lung cancer screening, such that it could reduce mortality by 20%. And the main goal is to maximize lung cancer detection and minimize over-investigation of benign nodules. A caveat to keep in mind is that even though we have these sets of guidelines, no single nodule management strategy will detect every lung cancer. So let's take this first case of an 83-year-old male came in for lung cancer screening. We see here a 9mm non-calcified solid nodule at the lingula which appears to be in contact with the pleural surfaces. By definition, a solid nodule is a circumscribed, rounded structure not more than 3 cm in diameter and surrounded by a rated lung and includes those nodules which are in contact with the pleura. So the central question now is what to do with this nodule. To simplify the guidelines, there are always three approaches. You can opt to discharge, do follow-up, or recommend further workup or definitive management. Now which nodules do we discharge? It is generally recommended that we don't offer further investigation for nodules with diffuse, central, laminated, or popcorn pattern of calcifications, nodules with macroscopic fat like hamartoma or lipoid pneumonia, as well as typical peripheral nodules also do not warrant further management. Radiologists can provide a report stating follow-up is not required, especially in patients less than 35 years old, but also mention that for people with a history of cancer, follow-up should be considered according to clinical judgment. So how about nodules that require definitive management? These include highly suspicious nodules which exhibit lobulated, speculated contour, nodules which have pseudo-cavitations as in this case, thick-walled cavities, and nodules with atypical calcifications. Nodules that exhibit large size, especially in high-risk patients, and nodules with significant growth also warrant investigation. So what do you do if the nodule is not necessarily benign or not necessarily actionable? This is where the guidelines usually come into play. And the recommendations depend largely on the size and volume. The larger the volume and size, the shorter the follow-up and the greater the need for intervention. So for our case, guidelines dictate that nodules more than 8 mm warrant short-term follow-up and or non-surgical biopsy or excision. In our setting, there is no single guideline that truly dictates management, but a widely utilized strategy by clinical counterparts is the BTS guideline, which uses risk prediction models and are more encompassing in patients of different risk population. This patient underwent follow-up with PET and showed a faint uptake of the nodule. The values together with other parameters are then encoded in calculators where the probability of a nodule to be malignant is then provided. And following the guidelines here in BTS, for example, a solid nodule that is more than 8 mm in size with more than 10% probability of being malignant, biopsy or further follow-up is recommended. Our patient went into a follow-up, which showed increased size because it grew by more than 25% from its mean baseline diameter. Biopsy eventually showed lung adenocarcinoma. Our next case is a 77-year-old female who had her screening CT and showed a solid nodule abutting a fissure and the mean baseline size is around 10.8 millimeters. So is this a peripheral nodule? Peripheral nodules are a separate and benign entity. 
Typical PFN is attached to a pulmonary fissure, it is solid with smooth margins. It can be oval, lentiform, or triangular, either within 1 cm of a pleural surface and is less than 10 mm. And these specific characteristics need no follow-up and represents intrapulmonary lymph node. Perifissurally located nodules that do not conform to the morphology characteristics should be recorded as non-PFN nodules. So for PFNs, the key point here is they are benign and require no follow-up. But you have to be strict with the criteria, as in our case, this is strictly a non-PFN morphology and showed increase in size and eventually was proven to be adenocarcinoma. So the goal of imaging is early detection, minimize unnecessary follow-ups, we have to be consistent in our techniques and terminologies. You have to be strict with peripheral nodules. And no single guideline can detect every cancer. Clinical judgment will always supersede the guidelines. We now proceed to the second part. Here we have a 75-year-old female with a pure ground glass nodule or subsolid nodule that was incidentally detected in the right upper lobe. So by definition, Subsolid nodules can be divided into part solid or pure ground glass. Part solid nodules are defined as focal opacity that has both solid and ground glass component. While pure ground glass nodules are focal opacities that does not obscure the underlying vascular pattern. It is also termed as non-solid. So guidelines recommend follow-up for these nodules at longer intervals of at least two years. Because even though subsolid nodules can be inflammatory and clear up in subsequent scan, such as in this case, the persistent ones tend to be biomarkers of early stage cancers with indolent or very slow growth, especially when they show increasing soft tissue component, as in this one, with documented volume time of around 3 to 4 years, while typical cancers tend to have a volume doubling time of just around 100 to 400 days. Which brings us to the spectrum. Adenocarcinoma is a heterogeneous lesion that is comprised mostly of mixed histology. Many of these lesions have lipidic tumor, which describes a pattern of growth along the alveolar walls and have been correlated with ground glass opacity on CT. While the invasive aspects are correlated with solid components. So the spectrum starts as atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. So remember the subsolid nodule, while felt to be incidental, this demonstrates molecular features that are already associated with adenocarcinoma. It then progressed to become adenocarcinoma in situ, which is previously known as bronchoalveolar carcinoma. It has purely lipidic growth, but no invasion of the stroma, vascular, or pleural surfaces. Then it becomes minimally invasive, which contains lipidic non-mucinous and mucinous components, and the five-year disease-free survival is still close to 100%. But as it becomes lipidic predominant, necrosis, vessels, lymphatic, and pleural invasion are now evident on histology, and the five-year disease-free survival drops to around 90%. And the spectrum of invasive or LPA continues depending on the predominant histology with the micropapillary type carrying the worst prognosis. So invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma, meanwhile, is another subtype which shows goblet or columnar cell morphology and is positive for the KRAS mutation but lacks the EGFR. Its spread is predominantly via the airways, so it has a propensity for multicentric, multilobar, bilateral involvement and usually would be seen as consolidation or airway-centric opacity. So imaging features correlate with pathology, which then translates to prognosis. And early recognition means better prognosis. So do not report persistent subsolid nodules as inflammatory. But you can say that indeterminate nodule, which may require surveillance. Now let's proceed to staging. Lung cancer is staged using the TNM classification 8th edition since 2017. TNM staging has three components and these are T, the location and morphologic characteristics of the primary tumor, 
N, the regional lymph node involvement, M, the distant metastasis. This can be used in the preoperative imaging and clinical classification, but it is also applicable for definitive pathological staging, the staging after therapy, and staging of a recurrence. We will focus on the preoperative imaging staging. The revisions in the 8th edition include changes in the T and M categories as well as in the stage grouping. T1MI and T1C were added as new T1 categories. And staging is important because it dictates the management, such that in the early stage non-small cell cancers, patients are usually treated with surgical resection. For stage 2 and 3 cancers, treatment is usually individualized based on risk factors and resectability. And late-stage cancers are usually treated palliatively. So, tumor size is determined by the maximum diameter of the solid portion in any of the three orthogonal planes in a 1 mm slice thickness long window. In subsolid lesions, T classification is defined by the diameter of the solid component and not the diameter of the complete ground glass lesion. Tumors less than 3 cm are classified as T1. Then T1 and T2 are further subdivided with 1 cm increments from less than 1 to 5 cm. T2 tumors are more than 3 but not more than 5 cm or tumor which invades the visceral pleura, mainstem bronchus, regardless of distance from the carina, and with atelectasis or obstructive pneumonitis. T3 tumors are more than 5 but not more than 7 cm, or any tumor size that invades any of the following, chest wall, phrenic nerve, pericardium, pleura, or separate nodule in the same lobe as the primary. T4 tumors are more than 7 cm or any size that invades the rest of the mediastinal structures including the diaphragm and vertebral body or separate nodule in a different ipsilateral lobe to that of the primary. For N and M staging, this diagram shows that N0 is no metastatic adenopathy, N1 is metastasis in the ipsilateral, peribronchial, and or hilar nodes and intrapulmonary nodes. N2 is metastasis in the ipsilateral, mediastinal, and or subcarinal nodes. N3 is metastasis in the contralateral, mediastinal, or hilar, or ipsilateral and contralateral, supraclavicular, or scalene nodes. N0 is no distant metastasis. A separate tumor nodule or nodules in a contralateral lobe or tumors with pleural, pericardial no nodules or effusion are classified as M1A. A single extrathoracic metastasis and involvement of a single non-regional node are classified as M1B. Multiple extrathoracic metastases in one or multiple organs are classified as M1C. Then, subsets of T, N, and M categories are grouped into certain stages because these patients share similar prognosis. For example, N10 disease or stage 1A has a 5-year survival of 77 to 92%. On the other end of the spectrum is any M1C disease or stage 4B that has a 5-year survival of 0%. Imaging studies determine the extent of tumor or its anatomic stage. Computed tomography covering the chest and upper abdomen, including the liver and adrenal glands, is the main imaging modality for the diagnosis and staging of lung cancer. CT can also help in guiding tissue sampling of the primary lung cancer, lymph node metastasis, or distant metastasis. PET CT MRI of the chest, brain CT or MRI, and bone scan are additional imaging modalities that can be utilized according to CT findings, clinical data, and histologic type of lung cancer. 
chest radiography, and ultrasound have limited utility in the staging of lung tumors. Here are sample cases of lung cancer in their preoperative stage. The first case, a 75-year-old woman who was brought to the ER due to abdominal pain, wherein her abdominal CT showed multiple hepatic cysts and enhancing nodules, lytic blastic osseous lesions in the lumbar spine and right sacral area, an incidental finding of a 2.5 cm speculated pulmonary nodule in the right lower lobe. These are suspicious for lung malignancy with possible liver and bone metastasis. FDG PET CT was eventually done and showed moderate uptake in the lung nodule. Lymph nodes in the right paratracheal and subcarinal regions as well as the right supraclavicular region are hypermetabolic. There is also a hypermetabolic lesion in the right rib. The hepatic nodules and multiple osseous lesions are likewise hypermetabolic. So what will be the TNM and radiological stage? This is T1C because the tumor size is more than 2cm but less than 3cm, surrounded by lung or visceral pleura. And 3 because of the presence of an ipsilateral supraclavicular lymph node in addition to ipsilateral mediastinal nodes. M1C due to multiple extrathoracic lesions. This is an advanced stage of lung carcinoma with distant metastasis. Patient was maintained on immunotherapy. Second case, a 40-year-old asymptomatic female with a 5.5 enhancing mass in the middle lobe, which indents the major fissure and contacts the pleura. On PET-CT, the mass is FDG-AVID. There are no other FDG-AVID lesions in the rest of the lungs. No effusion, hypermetabolic nodes, or distant nets. This is T3 because it's more than 5 cm. And 0 because there is no nodal metastasis. And M0 because there is no intra or extrathoracic metastasis. So, this case is an early stage of lung cancer, which is stage 2B. Patient underwent surgical management. Next case is a 62-year-old female who had a chest x-ray, which showed left parahylar soft tissue mass, and chest CT scan was done and confirmed a 5.8 cm paramediastinal mass causing complete cutoff of the left upper lobe bronchus and lobar collapse. The left pulmonary artery is encased and narrowed. There is loss of fat plane between the mass and a portion of the pericardium. PET CT scan showed that the mass is, is, is intensely FDG avid. The left-sided pleural effusion also shows mild FDG uptake. FDG avid solid nodules are also are also seen in the ipsilateral and contralateral lungs, the subcarinal, left peribronchial, and internal mammary lymph nodes are hypermetabolic. FDG avid enhancing lesion involving the right uve uveal wall, there are also hypermetabolic hepatic lesions and bilateral adrenal nodules. FDG avid lytic lesions are seen at the L5 and left sacral ala. Enhancing nodules with necrotic centers are seen in the right parietal lobe and left thalamus, as well as left cerebellum. However, these were not avid on PET, so we had to do an MRI, which confirmed presence of metastatic brain lesions. So this is T4 because of mediastinal invasion, M2, M1C, with radiological stage of 4B, an advanced stage. Patient was also maintained on immunotherapy. Our last case is a 60-year-old male presenting with a 9.4 lobulated mass in the left upper lobe 
with poor delineation from the mediastinal pleura. PET CT showed that this mass is FBG avid. We saw FBG avid nodes in the left supraclavicular as well as AP window and left hilum. So this is T4 and 3 because of ipsilateral mediastinal hilar and supraclavicular nodes and M0. Overall, this is stage 3C. Patient was given chemotherapy and immunotherapy. In conclusion, correct staging of lung cancer is essential for the selection of appropriate therapeutic plan and determination of prognosis. Contrast enhanced CT is the imaging modality of choice for the assessment of primary tumor and local extension. We reserve MRI for the evaluation of superior sulcus tumors and brain nets, and lymph nodes and distant metastasis are best evaluated by PET CT. We are not compelled to memorize everything or even place specific staging in our report, but it is essential that we will be able to recognize and and state relevant imaging features. These are our references, and with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you, doctors, for that wonderful lecture. We have gained so much knowledge regarding chest imaging protocols for lung cancer diagnosis and staging, and in that line, improve communication with our clinician and surgeon colleagues to better manage and take care of our patients. definite that everyone here tonight will agree with me when I say this evening has been so productive. We have learned so much and updated ourselves with the current radiology practice guidelines and algorithms for pediatric radiology covering childhood pneumonia, neuroradiology for the discussion of stroke, abdominal radiology focusing on liver cancer imaging protocols, breast imaging highlighting breast cancer imaging diagnosis and detection, and thoracic radiology focusing on lung cancer imaging guidelines. These principles certainly do not end here tonight. We have these to bring into our day-to-day -day practice, allowing us to accurately evaluate disease extent, which is integral in arriving at the optimal treatment approach. As radiologists, we play an important role in the multidisciplinary management of our patients and this evening, we were able to review and understand the different principles of staging and the implications of radiological findings on the various staging descriptors and eventual treatment decisions. So we have all heard the excellent and up-to-date lectures from our esteemed speakers with their expertise and knowledge of their topics. The valuable learnings that we've had from today's event are greatly appreciated and I hope that we can all apply them to our daily practice so we can help more in diagnosing and also in the further treatment of the pathologies discussed. And what better way to do that but to keep ourselves updated with the current practice guidelines to approach these cases in a standardized manner as to help our colleagues, the clinicians, and of course, our patients. I'd like to express my appreciation to the organizing committee for their hard work in putting up this academic activity my gracious co-moderator, Dr. Mary Rose Lazo, for helping me keep our audience up in their toes and in their seats. And of course, to our Institute Chairman, Dr. Nelson V. Pasha, again for spearheading IDOR 2022, and Dr. Bernadette Laya for always effectively laying the groundwork each year. With that, in behalf of our organizers of this event, I'd like to thank all the participants in this online academic activity and celebrating with us the International Day of Radiology 2022. We are truly grateful for your valuable presence and support.